Hi, everybody. Welcome back. This week, I have Jason on with us. I am super pumped to talk about performance, not only performance, but high performance. Jason is quite a remarkable person. I can't wait for him to share with you more about who he is, what he does, who he does it for, and also his journey that he got here. So with that said, Jason, I wanted to give you a big, warm welcome to the Tony Schaap Show. Thank you, Tony. Thanks for having me, man. I'm excited. Me too. Let's start it off with the one word open, Jason. So give us that one word right now that you could describe how you're feeling as we're kicking this off. Oh, one word. I think, I, th I think the word, is, there's several, probably there's a cocktail of feelings, I think. Uh, but uh, the one that's sticking out to me right now is inspired. Uh, and, and not just right now, but well, one is, you know, before we hit record, just talking with you, getting to know you a little bit. Uh, I love the way that you mapped out what you want for this uh, for this podcast and just like what, what you're up to. And instantly, Tony, like you're, you're, that's inspiring to me, just being treated well and connecting before we do this thing. That's really exciting. But, but also uh, I'm really inspired. And we talked about this earlier too. And I think there's something we have in common. Uh, I love teams. I love them. I love teams. And we'll talk a lot about that over the course of this conversation. And uh, I'm like a few nights ago, I got a, a text from my COO, Trisha, and she was like, I'm having so much fun. And it was like 10 o'clock at night or something. She's in New York City. And I was like, what, what, what's going on? And she goes, I just love seeing our team win. And to see her be so excited. And it was, I was tired, but that like lit me up. And, and earlier this week, uh, Amanda, who's one of our top performing coaches, she, uh, she like landed this amazing deal working with this huge uh, company, uh, which is like, it's a streaming company. It's got a higher subscription base than HBO Max. And, and, and she was like doing the happy dance uh, not only because she was excited for the work that she was going to do, and she was she really loves the CEO and the head of HR there, and she's just so honored to do the work, uh, but also because she knew that, that that deal created work for other coaches in our firm. And and it's just one of those, I know it's not always that way, Tony. I know like we're not, all, you know, it's ups and downs and there's journeys and everything. You know, obviously this past year has been really hard for a lot of people, uh, but we're having a lot of fun. And uh, it's, it feels, I have to remind myself to enjoy the seasons where you're winning. Uh, and so today is, one of the, today is one of those days and this is one of those seasons. Absolutely. First off, thank you so much for the kind words. And um, I'm super grateful for you to be on here. I can't wait to dive into that, what you mentioned. So let's get right into it. Talk, it. you know, tell us about your business, how you got you started, your why, the story, where you are today, and where you're going. And then let's just start off with that. Yeah, sure. There, I'll do a little bit of a shorter version and we can get into specifics as we want. So there, there's really two main companies. Uh, one is a coaching firm. There's an executive coaching firm. And uh, there's several dozen of us in a few different uh, countries, uh, a few different continents. And then there's an institute that we have uh, that right now is an institute for coaching. So we, we train people in our specific way of coaching. We help people build thriving coaching practices, serving high-performing leaders. Um, now, how I got into that is probably a, what you would expect. I mean, I used to be, so I got certified as a coach and I enjoyed that. And I can talk a little bit about why I did that. Uh, that was years ago. And then coaching, there, there are like most coaches, it's a solo sport. You know, most coaches, it's like first and last name.com and you're kind of promoting yourself and that's your deal and which is great. Um, but I found that to be very lonely. I found that to be um, a little unfulfilling. And I also found, I felt like I was leaving money on the table. I felt like I was leaving impact on the table. There's limits of what you can do when you're a solopreneur coach. And so I had some other friends who were coaches and, you know, everyone's kind of becoming a coach right now. It's pretty vogue. So I had, I had uh, some other friends who were becoming coaches and we were like, Hey, what if we, what if we work together, which was really scary, you know, cause we like worked out this economic model where we kind of like chip in some of our revenue into this pot. And this, all you can think about is how much money you're not going to make in the short term. And, but we kind of, we had this theory that we would win bigger and faster together. And that was, around six years ago. And our company has doubled in size year over year for the last five years and doubled in revenue every year. And uh, so it, it's been a really fun uh, experiment and kind of proof of concept for the power of solopreneurs working together and the power of uh, coaches specifically working together. And, and most of our coaches could, you know, they're, they're some of the best coaches in the world. It would be easy for them to, to go and and hang up their shingle somewhere and do their own thing, but they stick around. And that's, uh, I think that's a testament to the power of relating to each other in a, in a good way, in a way that brings out the best in everybody most of the time, <laughs> not all the time, but most of the time it brings out the best of everybody. That's really awesome. Thanks for sharing that with us. 
Let's go into some wins. Can you share with us a recent win and also what you learned from it? Because I want the audience to be right there with us in this conversation. Yeah, you know, there, I two, two wins when you, when I saw that question. There, there are two. I'll say two just briefly. The first one, which I think is, I'll, well, we'll see where we go. So, so the, the first one uh, is hiring well. I, I get really lucky, and I would do say lucky. I don't, I don't know if I have like a like a formula, you know, there's like top lining all these different protocols and everything for, for which is a, a book that you can buy on how to hire well. And it's like these like eight hour interviews and it's crazy, but you know, there's all these processes for hiring well. And I just, whenever it works, I, I read somewhere that if you can hire well 30% of the time, you're doing really well. So it's like baseball. Um, but I, I look at some of the things that we're doing now and I look at some of the people who are helping us do these things. And I just am so, I feel so fortunate. And so, and, and I'll, I'll give you like a little hint uh, at least from my experience in terms of how to hire well. And I, th I think if you were to ask the folks who, uh, who are really carrying the load in this season of moving our companies forward, uh, why they like to work here, I think it's because they, they really feel like, and you mentioned this before we started recording, they feel like they're up to something bigger than themselves. It's, they know that if, if I'm successful and our teams are successful, that it's going to have a positive impact in the world. And that's the kind of thing that people I think are longing to be a part of. And of course there's financial incentives and things like that. And we do that fairly well, but I think at the, at the core, if you would like to talk to the people who are part of what we do, it's like, man, I really, I really want to be a part of serving people. I really want to be a part of, I want to do something that makes me feel a sense of awe when I'm doing it. And you can, you can actually design that. You know, I think a lot of people uh, feel like do you have that or you don't, but you can make it, you can choose as you engage in your, in your company or your job or whatever, how to make it beautiful. And you can re if you don't feel like it's beautiful, you can actually re rewire it uh, towards beauty. The, the other thing that's, that are big wins right now, and this is kind of a weird feeling that I think probably some of your listeners, listeners will relate to. Uh, a lot of our coaches are starting to win at a level, like when, when the, when we started the company, I was the breadwinner in a lot of ways. I was bringing in a hundred percent of the revenue for me, but also like 50% of the revenue for a lot of other coaches in the firm. And that was a lot of pressure. And, and so we, we started implementing strategies around how to like get me out of sales where I, I wasn't always having to carry the sales burden. There's a variety of things we did to solve for that, but now it's like starting to pick up and the engine is starting to work. And, and now like the biggest celebrations aren't like my wins. They're other people's wins. And that's a mixed bag in some ways, because like on, on the one hand, you're thrilled, like you're so proud of the of your friends who are succeeding and winning, and, and you know that when they win, you win. On the other hand, it's kind of like uh, it feels it's felt recently a little bit like you've been pushing this car for like a while, and the engine finally kicked in, and then it, it like took off, and I fell on my face, and I'm looking up, and and luckily the people in the car are like, hey, like hurry up, get in, like we're gonna do this together. But it, it, it's a fun feeling to see it win, and also there's like, okay, now I'm in a position of like reevaluating what my greatest contribution to the company is. And, and it's, a, it's a fun season, but it's a little uncomfortable. I love what you said with the pushing the car and then the engine kicks on and you fall on your face because it takes off. I totally get that. As an eighties kid, you know, how many times does that happen growing up? Your friend had a stick shift and then yeah. you, put, you put it in second gear, pop the clutch, you know, you're pushing. Clutch. Totally, totally. That's so great. I love it. Yeah. But thanks for giving us that context and that analogy kind of brought it all together. So that's really wonderful. And, yeah. you know, to your point, you know, when you're making a difference and not only just a difference, but a positive difference and other people are bringing in the wins, it's a huge, it's, it's, it's unimaginable, right? It's just something yeah. that's your work that's compounding. With that said, on the other side of the spectrum, let's talk about some failures, unfortunately. Yeah. If, you ha if you could share with us a recent failure and what you learned from it, that would be great. A recent failure. Uh, uh, well, so, I mean, my biggest failure was my divorce and we can talk about that if you want i would say like the really inter i think usually the biggest failures a person's going to experience in their life are interpersonal not necessarily financial or things like that um and i would say that was my biggest failure recent failure that was a while ago that was in another time um but recently i would say my biggest failures recently i would say there's lots one is anytime uh I tend to get like frustrated when things aren't going the way that I want, or they're not moving as fast as I want, or at the, at the level of quality that I want, not even high quality. Cause sometimes what they want to do is better than what I want to do. It's just not what I want to do. And, uh, I get, I get snappy sometimes, or I get grumpy. Um, you know, some, there's some folks on our team who are very talented and add a lot of value to the firm. And sometimes we really butt heads and I'm not at my best self. And I think sometimes that, uh, decreases morale a little bit around here when, when Jason's in a bad mood, that's probably not good. So, 
I think as I step out of like the quote winning game, like winning work and winning contracts and those types of things, I think it's even more important for me to uh, begin being like the, the chief energy officer and making sure that I'm managing myself well and being the person on the team that raises performance versus maybe is more critical or those types of things. And so I think those are some things that I'm, I'm learning right now. And the failures look like me getting off a call and being like, man, like I wasn't really my best self. And then, you know, just to say this conversely, uh, I think there's sometimes I pull my punches, which is a weird thing. So sometimes I'm too critical and sometimes I pull my punches. And, uh, and what I mean is sometimes I don't say, I don't say the thing that needs to be said in order for us to get into alignment or to avoid the misalignment that we have. Um, and those two things swing together. So you, if you avoid conversations long enough, and then you have to have the conversation, you can blow things up. Uh, so I wish I would do that faster. So those are some things that I think that I have a lot to learn and to grow in. It's one of the reasons why I work with coaches in my own life. By the way, don't ever uh, hire a coach who doesn't have a coach. It's like going to the dentist who doesn't like to go to the dentist, you know. But um, yeah, those are some things that I'm learning and growing in and failing at. That's really great. Um, you know, this this question, I was kind of getting impatient. I couldn't wait to ask you this next question. Yeah, um, so when we're in our work and our mastery, we're doing, you know, what we're, our capability is. And the way a certain word, when you look at it, when you read it, when you say it, it occurs for you because you're in the business is very different than it is to anybody else. So here's the question. When you look at the word high performance, when you yeah. say the word, when you write the word, when you hear the word high performance, what does that mean to you, Jason? Yeah, that's, that's great. And I feel like you're setting me up a little bit. And I, and I, uh, I want to thank you for that because I, like, I do like the question. Um, I think, well, let me contrast it. Before I tell you what I think, I think here's what most people look at it. I think most people look at high performance as the holy grail. High performance, peak performance. There's lots of books about high performance, high performance mindset, those types of things. And, and by the way, that's the way that I looked at it for a long time as well. And that's, that's not bad. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's an okay way of looking at it. And I think the people who do look at it that way experience a large degree of success. Uh, but what was interesting is several years ago, we were, uh, we were having some meetings with a, like a Fortune 100 company. And we were doing some informal uh, coaching, some consulting with them. And towards the beginning of the relationship, I was like, hey, talk to us about what, what's the problem? Like, what are you up to? And their answer really surprised me. Their answer was, so I asked, what's the problem? They said, uh, well, we have a high performance culture. I was like, so what's, <laughs> so what's the problem? I mean, I thought that, that's what everyone wants. That's what everyone's trying to do. And then they described to me the symptoms of a high performance culture. And as I've, as I've spoken around the world and consulted and coached, uh, whenever I give this list, people start lighting up and they're like, oh my God, like I totally, that's, that's me or that's my team or whoever. So they were describing their team at a fortune 100 company, high performance team. And they said, well, we've got a bunch of divas on our team, people who are resistant to feedback. Uh, they get their feelings hurt really easily. Um, they get resentful whenever you try to get them to do more because it's kind of like, it's kind of like, uh, Maximus and gladiator. Like, are you not entertained? You know, like, like, don't you know who I am kind of a thing? There's this feeling of arrivedness. Uh, and then also there's this feeling of being at the same time, uh, overwhelmed and bored, which I, which I was like, wow, that's, that describes so many people that I know they're so busy. They're so stressed, but also they're just not enjoying their work. And after that conversation, we started coining what we now call the firm, the, uh, the high performance problem. And the reality is, is that most people, and if, you, if your listeners want, they can imagine like a pyramid and the pyramid represents uh, like a performance pyramid. And most people, like there's low performance at the bottom, there's performance in the middle, and then there's high performance at the top. So most people put high performance at the top. Well, the problem is, is once you see yourself at the top, look, there's not anywhere really to go. And, you know, we work with a lot of professional athletes and, and oftentimes when you talk to professional athletes, one of our, one of our coaches, Dan Lafalara, who's the head of our division, Novus Global Sport, he was telling me about uh, one of his clients who uh, just won the Stanley Cup. And oftentimes once you have that moment, you win the Super Bowl, you win the Stanley Cup, you win the championship, uh, there's this existential crisis. It's kind of like, now what? You know, because now you've accomplished this thing that you've worked so hard for, and people don't really know what to do with themselves. And a lot of people who move out of professional sport into like civilian life really struggle because how do you top that? And so, a question that our firm became obsessed with, and now it's just a part of our culture, is asking the question, what comes after high performance? And, and, and if you can't, if not you necessarily, Tony, but if a person or a team can't answer that question, they are 
very much in danger of the high performance problem, which leads to atrophy, leads to uh, decline, leads to other people overtaking you in the market, all sorts of problems that arise when you have the high performance problem. And so as we started asking that question, and we, we, we made up a phrase, but it's, we didn't make up the concept because you see this all over the place. But the phrase that we coined is meta performance. So you imagine above the high performance is meta performance and meta performance is fundamentally a different kind of conversation. Meta performance is where you're continually reinventing what high performance is for you. So there's this constant process of saying, okay, you can, you still get to say you're a high performer. So we're not like criticizing anybody. Great. Congratulations. Mazel tov. You're a high performer. But what we're asking you now is, okay, now what does it look like for you to reinvent that? What does it look like for you to go the, to the, back to the drawing board? And, you know, um, a friend of mine, her name is Linda Wolverton, and uh, she, she uh, wrote, the, wrote the script to Beauty and the Beast, and she wrote the script to Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland. She's, she's the highest paid, or what, sorry, she wrote the highest grossing film uh, for, for a female of all time. It was a billion dollars with Alice in Wonderland, Tim Burton. And her and I were talking recently, and she was like, uh, Kobe Bryant was a meta performer. Like, he got to the best of his game. And then he won an Academy Award for a short film. And she said, and she worked with Kobe a little bit before he passed away. And she, she told a story about how after Kobe won the Academy Award for a short film for Best Picture, he went up to the guys at Pixar, like uh, Ed Catmull and those guys who are at the Academy Awards and they're winning whatever it was they're winning that year. And he goes up to them and he goes, I'm coming for you, which is awesome. Like this guy who just won a short film competition, you know, is going up to the greatest storytellers in the history of cinematography and saying, you're next. Like that's meta performance. And that's the kind of thing we try to instill in our teams. I love that. Instilling that in your, in your teams and also, you know, meta performance. That's, that's the first time I've heard, heard that. So that's really, it's going to stick out for me going forward every, you know, whenever performance comes up, especially high performance, but that's great. And thanks for the pyramid too, that you gave that. I was visualizing it when you were speaking to it. So that was really great. Yeah. Thanks uh, man. Of course. You know, if you could give, that leader um, that's listening to this right now, and they're you know maybe dealing with some stagnation. What's that one piece of advice you could give them? So if they're listening to Jason right now, and they're like just dealing with whatever they're dealing with, right? If you could give them only one advice and just to help that person come out of stagnation and and really truly, you know, excel, what would that be? Yeah, I would, you know, ask me that question 50 times and I may give 50 different answers. But I, what I would say in this moment is when a person is dealing with stagnation, first of all, there's lots of reasons. So I want to ask more questions. But if you're listening to this and you're burnout or overwhelmed or dealing with like that stagnation, uh, there's two things I might suggest. Uh, and then I want to drill deeper. One is usually when people are, are, are tired or burnout, they're suffering from either a deficit in progress or purpose. So they're, they're suffering from a deficit of feeling like their lives are moving forward in some kind of way. Uh, it's amazing how oftentimes when you, you are frustrated or whatever, but then that deal closes or you are, you know, you're kind of burned out, but then that client calls you and wants to do more work or, or, you know, you're, you're, you're frustrated in your relationship, but then you have a breakthrough like that really reignites things. And so mo a lot of people think that the reason why they're tired is because they need to rest more, but really most of the time it's not because you need to rest more. It's because you need to experience the, the wind in your sails of, of progress. On the flip side, a lot of people have a lot of progress. So they're, they're winning, you know, they, uh, people on the outside looking at them and they're like, gosh, you have everything you want. You've got the relationships, you've got the, the money, you've got the, the success, you've got the companies or whatever. And they still feel uh, tired and burnt out. And with those folks, it's not progress that they're missing its purpose. It's they're, they're winning at a game they don't really care about. And so then it's a conversation around, okay, what are the games you really, really care about? And, and frankly, that's a scarier conversation. It's easy to have a conversation with someone who's lacking progress and just helping them win a little more. Uh, it's, it's can be a little scary talking to a person about what purpose looks like for them because it may change the game for them entirely. Uh, but ultimately it's always worth it. But those, that, that, that'd be my first take on that for right now. Thanks for sharing your take on that. And that was really deep. Yeah, thanks man. Yeah. What, what would you say? Um, I think it has a lot to do with your why and your purpose. Like you just touched yeah. on it. I yeah. couldn't agree with you more because the purpose is much greater than anything else. And if you have your why kind of anchoring it in a good way, I think yeah. I, so. I mean, you're the expert, so I, I have to agree with you. So well, that was really you. great. And we can, you know, Simon Sinek start with why. I think both of you and I would be like, yeah, what Simon said. <laughs> yeah, that's so great. 
Um, if we could go back in time, what would you tell your 21 year old self? What would I tell my 21 year old self? You see, I just, I got out of college early. Um, I was, I remember being so anxious when I was 21. Uh, what would I tell him? Man, these answers sound cliche, but they'd be true. I would say you want, I would say swing for the fences, start swing bigger, uh, and I'll, I'll be specific. There's two ways I would love for my 21 year old self to, to swing for the fences that he didn't when he was 21. Uh, Cause the 21 version of me loved getting people together. And I loved, I loved uh, picking the, the best people that I could work with. I actually got criticized in my first job when I was 21 for like recruiting the, the best talent to work with me. Like it was a bad thing. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was kind of weird, but um, I think, but even then I think, everyone kind of, everyone lives into the size of the vision they have for themselves. And I, even then I remember not really giving myself permission to dream a, a little bigger. Uh, one of my favorites, I love, I love film. I love movies. I love that I live in LA. A lot of our clients are in the entertainment industry and uh, uh, there's a movie inception. Have you seen inception? Do you like inception? Great. Yeah. So there's this, yeah, there's this scene where uh, Joseph Gordon Lovett and Tom Hardy, they're, they're in a dream, in a dream, and they're getting attacked by the person's dream subconscious or whatever, who knows. But, uh, and uh, Joseph Gordon Lovett is like popping his little pistol at these guys, like trying to attack these guys. And uh, Tom Hardy's character says to, to Joseph Gordon Lovett's character, he says, uh, you mustn't be afraid to dream a little bigger, darling. And then he, he pulls out of nowhere a rocket launcher because it's dreamland. You can do whatever you want. He pulls out a rocket launcher and like fires at these guys who are shooting them and blows them up and everything. And, and that moment has always stuck with me. Like you mustn't be afraid to dream a little bigger, darling. And, and I think the, the corollary to that is you mustn't be afraid to uh, make choices that are a little bolder, darling. So like if you, if you wanted to accomplish that, that incredible irresponsible dream, uh, who would you need to ask for help? Who would you need to, uh, to work with? Give yourself permission to go after the best, get turned down, I think people don't get rejected nearly enough. I think people, I think people think that they get rejected a lot. I think most people don't get rejected as nearly as they need to get in order for them to get to where they want to go. And I find that rejection are the step. Every act of rejection is a stepping stone towards where you want to be. And uh, and I would I would say you know so dream bigger, make bigger asks of people, and uh, get rejected a lot more often. And I think that that would have radically changed. I love where I am in my life, but that would have radically changed my life. That was beautiful. Um, it's great for you to be so humble to put that out there. You know, um, huh. you know that's really great. So, I was a late bloomer. <laughs> I totally you could relate to that. <laughs> so, can you share with our audience what's, um, you know, what was that one question that you you wish I would have asked you, but I I didn't ask you. What would that question be, Jason? Yeah, I saw that in the yeah I saw that when you had typed up what you were, we could possibly talk about and. I, uh, the question I like being asked most of all is about the people in my life who are challenging me, who are smarter than me, more believable than I am. I'm a huge fan of Ray Dalio, by the way. So, um, Ray Dalio is head of Bridgewater. It's the most successful wealth management company in the history of the world. He wrote an amazing book called principles. And then he talks about this concept of believability. So like surrounding yourself with people who are believable in the things you're trying to do. And in fact, I know Tony, you have the same passion. I, you know, I've saw on your website, you talk about how mentors have really played a huge role in your life. And I was like, oh man, I love this guy. Like, that's exactly it. Like, there's no such thing as anybody who's winning is not doing it on their own. They have help. Uh, and usually that help is in the form of coaches or mentors. And so I, I, I like it when people ask me, it's, and I'll say this briefly too. I think a lot of times people, my clients like to talk about me. Like one of my clients, Jeff Lambert, just wrote an article on Fast Company about our working relationship. And he, you know, so he's like an evangelist for our work, but a lot of people who work with coaches, like they, they want their coaches to be their secret weapon, uh, operative word secret, which is totally fine. I, I totally get why, why that happens. But at the same time, like I, I love talking about my coaches and my mentors. Like I worked with a guy named Steve Chandler, who's like the godfather of coaching. He's out of Michigan. I worked with another guy named Steve Hardison, who's like one of the best coaches uh, in the world. And I flew, to, I flew to Phoenix twice a month for like a year and a half to meet with him. Uh, and that was amazing. I, I loved that, you know, and, and I have mentors like a guy named Mark Jordan, who's a mergers and acquisitions guy. And he meets with me and, and helps me with like all sorts of things. And he's got a great marriage. And he's got a great family. And, and I just, I'm constantly trying to surround myself uh, with people who are smarter than me, 
uh, they make better choices than I do. They have maybe even better character than I do that I can always be learning from. And, and so those are, those are the questions I like being asked. That's really great. Thanks for giving that insight to us. Um, and now here we are as we're sadly getting to the end here. It's very um, sad. I know because we're, we've totally hit our stride. So um, how could our listeners find out more information if they want to reach out to you or find out more information, what, you're, what you guys do and who you do it for? Yeah. Uh, I mean, you can always go to our website. So our company, the, the firm is called Novus Global, N-O-V-U-S. So you can go to novus.global. That's it. No dot coms or anything like that. Novus.global. You can email me if you want at jason at novus.global. Uh, and then I'm on all the things. So like Clubhouse, uh, which is kind of a new thing. Uh, you can go to, I'm just Jaggard, which is my last name, uh, J-A-G-G-A-R-D. Uh, you, you can find me on Instagram. This is Jaggard. Uh, on Twitter, it's J Jaggard. I'm trying to get that changed. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's, I'm all over the place. If you Google me, I'm, I'm around. Awesome. Appreciate that. I'll, I'll put down the show notes for our listeners as well. And here we are at the final question. If you could sign us off with a one word close and why you're choosing this one word close, that would be great. Yeah. My one word close right now is grateful. I, uh, well, one is, uh, that's something I'm wanting to grow in. You know, it's funny. The, I, I, I haven't found a way to make this land the way that I want it to whenever I say this to other people, but I'm, so I'm going to try again here. Like if, if I were to tell you there was a thing that uh, made you more attractive, helped you live longer, made you healthier, happier, increased your net worth, all these things, and it cost you absolutely nothing, you, you probably, you probably want to know what that was. And of course, the secret is gratitude. Uh, but what's interesting is, uh, even though this thing is amazing and it's totally free, I'm so resistant to it. <laughs> like I, I, there's a part of me that doesn't want to be grateful. There's a part of me that, and it's weird. It's like, I, I'll go buy workout equipment. I'll spend money on toys, you know, like adult things. And I'll, 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 uh, uh, try to like only if I meet the right, I'll be happy if I meet the right woman. If I, if I have this kind of success, if I can buy the yacht or whatever, all of these things that, that go in your mind and, uh, and here's your gratitude is just there right in front of you and it's totally free and I'm totally disinterested in it. So I'm trying to practice uh, cult uh, cultivating uh, gratitude in my life. And, and that, that is how I feel. And I forget sometimes that I'm grateful, but I don't even realize it. So right now I'm feeling gratitude. Really appreciate that. And thanks for making this such a meaningful interview. It's been, it's been a pleasure to have you. I can't wait to have you back on the show sometime yeah. in the near future. Yeah, absolutely, Tony. Thank you. And I hope you have an amazing, we're recording this on a Friday. I hope you have an amazing Friday and a great weekend. You too. Thank you.